Today I would like to present to you Museum and our attempt to make art easily accessible with crowdsourcing and gamification. Museum started as my PhD at the UCL here in London and it was actually based on a very simple idea. So what struck me was that although there is a go-to platform for all popular forms of content, such a platform for art had yet to emerge. So if I wanted to watch movie trailers, I would go on IMDb. If I wanted to read a book review, I would go on Goodreads. But what if I wanted to look up an artwork? I would still go to Google or any other generic search engine. But in our day and age, where everything has already been invented, if something hasn't been done before, it can really be only for two reasons. It is either unnecessary, so you have, a great idea, you have an idea, you think it's great, but nobody else does. Or it's impossible, so your idea is great and many people would like to see it become a reality, but it's just very, very hard to implement. For Museum, I discovered it was the latter. So before I even started with it, I looked into whether it's possible at all to make a platform that has the capacity and the foundation to become the go-to platform for art. And what I discovered was actually quite revealing. Although all go-to platforms are based on crowdsourcing, this approach had never been taken for art. So at that stage, I told to myself that we at least had to try. So that's how Museum was born, the first ever crowdsourced art museum. It started from my part-time PhD studies, and after we received a seed round of 100,000 pounds, it transformed to a fully-fledged startup company. Today, Museum exhibits 70,000 paintings by 8,000 artists, including 2,000 contemporary participant artists from 105 countries around the world. The community has given 100,000 ratings, has used more than 25,000 meta, 25, meta tags to describe works of art, and it counts 200 senior contributors. Being the first ever crowdsourced art museum, our goal was only one, to empower our users. And the groups of users we approached were mainly two at start, the artists and the art lovers. So for the artists, museum offers numerous benefits. The first is a new platform to promote their portfolio. But it's not just any other platform. Museum is the first platform that is specialized in their medium. By exhibiting only painting and illustration, Museum is the perfect platform for the work of painters and illustrators from all around the world for their art to, be, to stand out and be appreciated. Last but not least, we gave artists the opportunity to profit from selling gifts and prints worldwide and on demand at no cost. For the art lovers, the first thing we did was we enabled the most commonly used form of crowdsourcing and cultural product, projects, the ability to describe works of art with meta tags. Art lovers on museum express their opinion, not only with comments, but also by rating artworks. The user base of museum is the platform's curator, as all the rankings and the recommendations are all being implicitly crowdsourced by the user's ratings and activity. We also allowed art lovers to add artworks on the platform, and that was an innovative feature that was very hard to implement, and we will see later on why. And last, it's been a few months now that we've introduced textual educational content on the platform, which has all been written and reviewed by contributing authors. So why would such a platform help make art easily accessible? If we look up the term on the dictionary, to be accessible means to be easily obtained, easily understood and appreciated. Essentially, what we're doing on Museum is we're taking, we're organizing all the information that is available about art on the internet and make it easy for people to search, browse and learn about. Then the reason that we introduced educational content was to explain art history in simple language. So now you can go on Museum to learn what is Impressionism, what is hyperrealism, the movement's history and context, all with simple terms. Last, I consider appreciated being very closely linked with understood. The minute we learn about something, we find out about its context, be it historical or political, then we really get to appreciate it. 
But our grand vision, so to say, when it comes to the accessibility of art, is that museum will help change the notion that art is uh, something distant and exclusive, meant only for the privileged few. So I am using IMDb to watch trailers, to rate movies, to keep my list of favorites, but I don't consider myself a cinephile. I, in fact, I'm not a cinephile. And the same should be the case for art. We don't need to be art world insiders in order to enjoy and appreciate art. So previously I, meant, I, I mentioned that enabling art lovers to add artworks on the platform was quite challenging. So here I would like to go into a bit more detail. So the first thing, the first challenge that we faced was that we were one of the, Museum was one of the few crowdsourcing platforms that asked volunteers to contribute images, not just textual content. And that was actually very challenging because users are not very familiar with that. So we had to explain to our users that when it comes to adding artworks on Museum, Museum functions as a user-generated content platform, but with the purpose of crowdsourcing. Because what is it that distinguishes user-generated content from crowdsourcing is exactly that, the purpose, the existence of an end goal, that all the content users are contributing is being organized and used towards the project's end goal. Today, to every day, we generate tons of content for YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest. But besides the fact that this content is being shared with our followers, not much really happens to it. On the other hand, when IMDb was starting 25 years ago, those early contributors, the content they were adding, was being used towards their vision to build the internet movie database. And the same was the case for Wikipedia and for every other crowdsourcing platform. Now, explaining to contributors the concept of image-based crowdsourcing is one thing. Now, if we take into consideration that not those images are not photos that they themselves took, then this brings another big challenge, that of copyright. So having the privilege of having investors on board, from very early on, we arranged the meeting with an art copyright expert. So after we explain to him what is it that we're trying to do, asking for his advice, how we should be doing it properly, he bluntly turned back and said, well, you can do that. You know, it's impossible. And then we said, but so many people are doing it. You know, people are on, on Pinterest every day, tons of images from all around the web. And then he said, well, that doesn't make it legal. And then we said, well, but we've thought about, you know, citing the source and make it a big deal. We always give credit to the creator. And he said, well, we still found out that unless the image is licensed under Creative Commons, that doesn't matter either. So how did we address that? We went straight to the copyright owners. So for more than a year, Museum was exhibiting only contemporary art from participant painters and illustrators from all around the world. And then one day, a friend of mine forwarded to me a press release stating that the National Gallery of Art in Washington was making available thousands of, thousands of old master's images for anyone to use. And in the following months, more and more museums would follow the footsteps of the NGA. So with a favorable timing on our side and with the help of our contributors, we were able to bring old masters on museum. Last, motivation was a great challenge, not only for us, but for any, for any platform involving crowdsourcing. Because what we discovered is that motivation has actually a lot to do with crowdsourcing. By definition, motivation to, to be motivated means to be moved to do something. And there are mainly two types of it. First is intrinsic motivation, where I'm doing something for its inherent satisfaction because it's fun or it's a challenge I would like to take, which is the exact opposite of extrinsic motivation, where I'm doing something I don't particularly like, but I'm gonna get paid for it or it's gonna look great on my CV. So how does motivation relate to crowdsourcing? Well, if there's one thing that defines crowdsourcing, is that participation is optional. People need to be moved to participate in your project, and they won't do so otherwise. Now, for paid crowdsourcing and money-driven crowdsourcing projects, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Because research shows 
that the main incentive of participants is the financial reward. So money is an extrinsic incentive strong enough for people to participate. But what about voluntary crowdsourcing? The absence of extrinsic incentives makes it quite hard to motivate participation. That's the gap gamification comes to fill in, and since its emergence, it has been widely used for crowdsourcing projects. By definition, gamification refers to the use of game design elements in non-game contexts. So the frequent flyer programs and the American Airlines AA Advantage in the 90s were one of the earliest examples of gamification. The only problem with the rise of gamification, however, in around 2011, was that what was actually happening was not gamification, but pointification. There was this perception that to gamify something meant that I had to just add a point system, some badges, and a leaderboard, and that would do. However, as game designer and Carnegie Mellon professor Jesse Sell said, gamification is about the fundamental understanding of what is pleasurable to people. And to gamify means to pleasurize. So if I want to gamify an application, for example, it means that I have to do it more pleasure, to make it more pleasurable for users. Essentially, what gamification does is that it taps on people's intrinsic incentives. We no longer need to give them money or any other external reward because we offer them intrinsic incentives. So how do we do that? One of the earliest frameworks of gamification was presented by Dieter Dink, and here I'm going to cover its three main points. The first thing is that gamification acts as an amplifier. Your platform must offer real meaning to its users, or at least it should involve them in a story that makes them feel meaningful. The second thing is mastery, to offer your users the experience of feeling competent. And how do we achieve that? By providing them with clear goals, with variable challenges that are neither too hard to execute, nor too, so that they get nervous, nor too easy so that they get bored. And the last is autonomy, to provide users with the tools as well as with the freedom to explore. In other words, with a free space to play in and something to play with. Gamification on Museum was designed around these three pillars. From the very beginning, we were inviting contributors to help build the world's art museum, involving them in a story that makes them meaningful. Then we try to give them, we give them clear goals with variable challenge, with variable levels of challenge, and we try to offer them experiences of mastery. So if you've managed to become the top contributor of the Getty Collection, from now on, your name will appear on the profile of the Getty Collection on Museum. And last is autonomy. The more senior contributors become on Museum, the higher the functionality, the, high, the more the tools they unlock, the higher the level of their freedom on the platform. Now, since we've been running gamification for a couple of years now on Museum, I would like to share with you a couple of observations. First, if you're willing to give your users freedom, you should be prepared to be surprised because contributors will take initiative and you will catch yourself thinking, well, that's not what that button was supposed to be for. But essentially what contributors are doing at that stage is that they are rethinking your platform and we embraced that and we worked directly with, it, with them and we actually encouraged contributors to do so. And the second thing is communication. It may sound very basic and very simple, however, on a platform like Museum, where the same entry can be edited by 10, 20 different people, it's really important that all these people are in sync. So one last thing before I go. I mentioned that our mission on Museum is to make art easily accessible. And also I've mentioned the efforts we've done in order to properly deal with intellectual property rights. So today, I'm excited to announce that Museum will be joining the open data movement. And in the next few months, we will be making available, available for download, 50,000 copyright-free old master's images. Access to images has always been a very, very complex matter. So we are thrilled to say that Museum will be the first platform 
that it will be very easy for people to search, browse, and download in high resolution public domain images from famous paintings in high resolution. And with that thought, thank you very much. <laughs>